Hello there and welcome to the show. Today we shall be taking you to the Netherlands where Kenyan artist Steve Biko Otieno is sharing his culture through his music and fashion. Also on the show, we shall be checking in on Lucy Kinyanjui, a Seattle-based entrepreneur who's opening a consultancy firm right here in Kenya to help other entrepreneurs find their way to the U.S. market. My name is Michael Zimanje, and here is what we have in store. He is a fashion designer, musician, clinical psychologist, and media personality. I wanted many things, and those things that I wanted, I could not achieve them in Nairobi. Yes, Steve Biko Otieno shares his journey as an artist in the Netherlands. There is nowhere in this planet that it is easy, and connecting with people here is very hard. Also on the show, Seattle-based Kenyan entrepreneur Lucy Kinyanjui now starts a consultancy firm to assist Kenyan exporters find their way into the U.S. market. My consultancy will be assisting in terms of compliance and marketing intelligence. With that out of the way, let's go to the Netherlands with Alex Chamwada. Steve Biko is a man of many talents. He is a recording artist, fashion designer, psychologist, and media personality. I used to be a presenter for Baraka FM in Mombasa, so I was doing like the FM thing, you know, it was in my blood, and straight from school to the FM microphone, and uh, did that for at least six years, and then moved to the UK. Which year? Years sometimes cross and go and leave my mind. Must have been 2005, 2006, maybe even four. So if I throw a stone back, I have at least eight years in the UK, and now I have 10 in Amsterdam. Yes, Biko has been daring in Europe for about 20 years now, a decision that was influenced by his love for music and art. I was young and I wanted many things. And those things that I wanted, I could not achieve them in Nairobi. I wanted to actually make music and expose what I was trying to do. The music industry was difficult. Producers were a certain way. You had to be a celebrity to fit in. Or you had to have money, or you had to know someone. You have to have the ins. Fashion was almost impossible because the fashion industry was almost non-existent. You know, I was born when we used to buy clothes from Dickons and stuff. And looking back, I'm like, and then it went second hand, second hand took over. So really building an, a brand and actually making in Kenya was difficult, you know. I wanted to study. University cost a fortune. My father didn't have the money then. So I had to find a way to be able to achieve my dreams. And the only way was to leave the country. Why are you going for studies or you got a job or you went to see a relative? What took you to the UK? <laughs> I found a panya route, they say. Kichochoro. I went as a voluntary worker for an, a Christian organization called Lee Abbey. Lee Abbey accommodates students who come from all over the world, who are looking for a place that is international, that they can already meet people from different parts of the world and share their story and feel at home. So I was there working for them uh, uh, in the front desk and helping them run the place. And they would give us an opportunity to start a life and, and look for something that we could find and, and build something. But you had one year, you had one year to catch your fish, they would say. That was how Biko got his start in the UK and with luck on his side, his gamble paid off and he eventually found a way of prolonging his stay. It wasn't an easy life. I was hustling, trying to put things together, but it was possible to do it. But I would work seven days a week, for example. Eh? Seven days, every day I was occupied. I was enjoying myself. I had a social life. I would work in an um, eye clinic and do administration during the week. And in the weekend, I would do catering. You know, silver service, serving food. It was Monday to Monday, I was busy. But uh, that life has its toll. And at some point, I wanted to start a family. And I missed home a lot. I missed Kenya so deeply. So I decided to move back to Kenya. I moved to Kenya, I got a job in Capital FM. I was doing uh, Urban Nights with Peter Mushai. And I ended up having the international audience listening to me because we'd work at night. And the nights at America, the UK. So it's like I went back to something I, I escaped in a way. I wanted to connect with Kenyans, but I ended up being in conversation with people abroad again. And uh, meanwhile, while I was doing that, 
I met my wife, who is now the mother of my two beautiful daughters. She's from the Netherlands and she was involved in music. She was actually starting with Saudi Soul then and just a band because she started the, the label called Peña Music. That's where they actually grew. And uh, I was on the microphone so then I could play the music they were making. And so we had this great relationship and we never stopped talking and now we have two kids. This relationship eventually led to Biko relocating once again barely two years after his return to Kenya. But this time round, it was all about love. When I moved to Holland, the first thing I needed to do, I needed to find something to do. And uh, finding something to do depends on speaking the language, because they speak Dutch here. Yeah. Of course they speak English, but everything around me happened in Dutch. So the only choice I had was to follow my pride, go to a school, learn the language, and then see how I can connect with everyone. And it was while studying Dutch that Biko made the decision to further his studies. I went to the University of Leiden. I'm a master in clinical psychology and uh, I also do social research because um, I'm, I'm also a, a social worker with that. So I have two layers of, of work. But my main hub, what actually connects everything, is psychology because uh, I look at the mind behind the mind behind the mind behind the process. Uh, at the moment I work for the city council here in, in Amsterdam in the uh, west. It's called Bos and Loma and there I help parents with children who are having a difficult time with development and also who just want to have better quality of life. In addition to his main hustle, Biko found a new passion, fashion. My life as an artist is storytelling because I realized me as a Kenyan who's lived in Europe for 20 years has been many different places. I was like, I'm in Europe, but if I look around, the dressing, the food, the zest for life, the love, the, the loss, the hate, the attraction is the same. So my art was visual and it was with clothing and I was really doing a lot of print at the beginning, like really working on Kitenge, inspired by Billy Abel, you know. Kofi Day's way of doing things inspired me from Congo. You know, Kalamashaka, I like what they were doing. So I was really also trying to show my traditional sense of how we do the traditional thing at home in Awasi for occasions, you know. I tried to translate that into what I see around me and it was my way to connect with people because then they would see the story or share the story by wearing what I made. And for them appreciating and loving and wanting it and seeing and realizing and feeling the story, for me that was like I'm welcome here. They understand me. We have this conversation visually. Being the creative that he is, Biko still doubles in music. <laughs> music is something that has been in me ever since I was a very young child. And uh, it really grew when I was in high school. In Onjiko, in Ahero, there was a big park called Olualo Park, and I was part of the drama club. At Olualo Park, we played drums, sticks, stones, bottles, and everything you could find to make sound. And we would dance and sweat and just feel the spirit of the night. So when I came here, I, I went to, uh, they called them festivals, and they were techno parties. They played this electronic dance music with keyboards and those big drums and big sounds. But when I listened keenly, it was exactly what we did with sticks, stones and drums and empty bottles, but they just had more complicated equipment. So that really attracted me to want to share the stories like, hey, I can hear what you're saying, but you're saying it differently. I can say it with my drums. I can say it with my sticks and my stones. So I met a few people here and there, shared the story. We did a few tracks. And before I realized that I was actually on the stage with them. So now I work with a label called I&I, &I. it's uh, in Harlem, it's a small label. The biggest band there is uh, Gallo Street, they do jazz, but like big jazz, they blow the room up. And um, one of the guys who's called uh, Ribier, he is one of the saxophonists, he's very great. He's now the keyboardist in the band that I play with, with a guy called Cherek Olima Music uh -huh. on Spotify. Biko's life has truly come full circle, from being a struggling artist in Kenya to flourishing in the same field abroad. But even with all his success, he still insists the journey has its challenges. Art needs money, and that is the most difficult thing to make art grow, you know? Money. Money makes things grow. Money is not everything, but it makes the world go round. But now, that I've exposed my art somehow and there's interest and there's places I go, 
money is kind of coming out of these small holes that I've, I've been poking in a way, you know? But a money flow would make art flow. The son of Awasi, Kisumu County, does however believe that the Kenyan music scene has a lot to offer and that the country is making positive strides. Our country has improved by the way. I'm very proud of Kenya right now with the legal system and with information and with, with e-citizen. That, that stuff is, is on. It's on. It gives me motivation to, to do stuff, you know. But here they are a, a step ahead and we are getting there. I don't think we're, we're no longer a third world country that people used to say. We are a developing country and we are growing very fast and Africa is a new, is a new Europe new first world, in my vision, I think. According to Biko, Kenyans abroad are now able to remain close not only to their friends and families through technology, but they are also able to access government services just at the touch of a button, thanks to improved online services. I applied for my passport on eCitizen Online, for example. I applied for an e-visa online. You used to have to go to the embassy and wait. Everything is online and it's efficient and it works. I was in communication with someone in Nyayo house with my phone. It's a revolution, it's changed. We used to have to call the landline and know someone who knows someone and go and wait and then upange laini ungoje, bado, I used to have to go to Western Union and wait in the queue and hope the system is not down. I couldn't be more thankful. Mainly used by M-Pesa? Uh, M-Pesa is the main one and there's a World Remit online. All these platforms, they connect easily. It's just a matter of logging, password, finding the right place and then you connect. And this is part of the reason why the old boy of Onjiko High School in Kisumu County is still investing back home. I'm investing in my going back because I want to, that will be the end, that will be the closing chapter. I want to end it there and I want to end it there well, at least. I am uh, working with people back home now to connect the diaspora to the Kenyan mainstream. When I came here, I figured out there's a lot of mixed race Kenyans or mixed race Jamaicans. So a black community that is not mainstream and is also not where they come from because they've been here so long so they're kind of floating. So that bubble, I'm trying to connect it to Kenya and um, East Africa you could say and have people I'm speaking to with like, like Rapture the Scientist. We are in a very close conversation to do something very interesting that can bring real change to them over here. Can you, can you see that now? From his 20 year experience abroad, because parting shot is, prepare to fight for your dream because making it abroad is not for the faint-hearted. There is nowhere in this planet that it is easy. Living in Europe is a tough thing and connecting with the people here is very hard. The fabric is tough. You, I have stretched my hands out for a long time to be able to, to, to get to this place where I can do these things with everyone around me, with my network. It's taken literally going to look for them and talking to them. So whether you're in Kenya or in Europe, the amount of effort you need to put to make it, it's comparable, it's not a given. It's a constant push. And giving up is not an option. Thank you, Alex, for that story from the Netherlands. Time for us to go on a break, but when we return, Seattle-based entrepreneur Lucy Kinyanjui opens a consultancy firm to help other exporters find their way to the U.S. market. Home Aid Training Center is a Washington-based organization providing high-quality and standard education and training to healthcare workers since 2017. Along with other entities owned by a managing director, Professor Steven Jenga, other services we provide include smart custom and print services, notary services, cooperative bank diaspora account opening, student placement program, book publishing, company registration, and the Western Union agent. For details, call us on plus one two zero six five six six four six seven six or plus two five three. 8939768 or visit us at 1305 South 312th Street Unit 202 Federal Way Washington 98003 located behind Hmart
Welcome back to the show. Now, our next guest is no stranger to Daring Abroad as we featured her earlier in the year at her shop in Seattle City. Well, Lucy Kinyanjui is now back in the country to launch her very own consultancy firm. For what reason, you may ask? Well, Alex Chamwada has more. There is Managu, there is Dodo, Managu, there is Saga. Yeah. Which one is the most popular? Kunde? Yeah, the most popular is Dodo, Dodo. Managu, yeah. Nakudo. When we met her at her store in Seattle City in the U.S. in December 2021, Lucy Kinyanjui indicated that her dream was to go big in offering consultancy services to Kenyan exporters keen on venturing into the U.S. market. I decided why can't I bring Kenya to the U.S.? You know, because I knew there was a gap. I, I knew it was very difficult to get things, you know, uh, from Kenya to here. And also, why can't we also promote our country in this country? And the dream has come true following the successful registration and approval of her consultancy firm in the U.S. My consultancy will be assisting all training companies and individuals who want to export their products to the U.S. in terms of compliance with food, American Food and Drug Administration. That is a body that actually regulates all food products, both in the U.S. and products entering to the U.S. There's also marketing intelligence, so I'll be helping the small businesses or, you know, the big companies access the market in the U.S. And that one, I work very close with a company called American Global Market. They are the ones who help to ensure that the products enter the U.S. market. I'll also be training the companies here in Kenya on what the Food and Drug Administration expects because the packaging has to be this way. They have steps that they look at, you know, the packaging and the language that is used has to be in compliance with the American market. So that is actually a challenging because some products have to, to be repackaged all over again. Just to re-emphasize, any product imported into the U.S. market must adhere to regulations of the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. FDA is responsible for protecting the public health by ensuring the safety of the nation's food supply, among other services. The requirements affect areas like nutritional facts, packaging, and labeling. That one is a key thing. That's what the FDA looks for, the labeling, because what happened is, even in the U.S., the labeling was different, and the U.S. government felt that companies were putting very tiny numbers on, you know, like calories and sugar levels, so people don't see them. The calorie has to be in bold. It has to be big numbers and bold. And we don't have in Kenya that technology to come up with that type of labeling. And that is where now my company or my consultancy firm will actually help people to understand. Because I had a lot of challenges with some of the products because the companies couldn't even understand what, what I'm talking about in terms of the rebooting. There are two things that a company can do. A company will give the ingredients, a list of the ingredients in that product. So if you don't give the ingredients, then you have to go through two steps. You have to go through steps of taking the, the product to the laboratory for chemical analysis. Then from that analysis is uh, where the expert will come up with the appropriate food labeling. But if a company wants to give the list of ingredients, then the product doesn't have to go to the laboratory. It can go direct to the food labeling expert. Then with those list of ingredients, they'll be able to uh, come up with, you know, number of calories, number of carbohydrates and all that. The timing of Lucy's consultancy couldn't be better. She says the U.S. market is ripe for African products. The U.S. is into healthy foods right now. And uh, of course, you know, U.S. doesn't grow some of those things. So they are looking to source in, um, you know, African countries like Kenya. And so 
they are looking at healthy snacks, black beans, the rice, you know, all those products and juices, healthy juices, because we produce really organic products here. So that's why they are really interested. And, and the market is there. And I work with the company, it's called um, Global Marketing. So that company is based in uh, New York and they actually help companies from, you know, from Africa to get market because my company is not just going to focus on marketing for the Africans in the U.S. It is going to be, a, you know, a U.S. market. That, that's why they have to meet all the regulations because it's a U.S. market, not, you know, just exporting to the Af Africans in the U.S. Lucy, who hails from Gatundu in Kiambu, Kenya, has been distributing and selling Kenyan products in the U.S. for the last five years. Her enterprise is known as Lukinya International, located in Kent, Seattle City, in Washington State. She also has a store selling American products at her Nairobi branch at Upperwood Adams along Gong Road. I actually send import products from Kenya to the U.S. and those are mainly in uh, food products and apparel like clothing and accessories. Um, I also do a lot of wholesale, especially with the food products in the U.S. And most of the products that I import um, from Kenya to the U.S. Um, like beans, black beans, dangos, you know, all types of bean, rice, bichori rice, and I have a contract with um, Spice World, which actually, you know, manufactures beans, black beans, butterfly. Those are mainly the things that I sell in the U.S., both in um, retail and uh, wholesale. But it has not been easy for Lucy. She has had her own share of challenges. For example, she had to go back to the drawing board when regulations about labeling of products were changed. So I had had to do things backwards because already the products, by the time the products go to the U.S., the rule had already taken place. So we started doing the backwards and this was very, very challenging because one thing, FDA will not tell you what to do. So I had to Google, I had to call companies and, uh, you know, figure out. There's what they call reconditioning. So what they can do for you, they can give you chances, only two chances to bring the products into compliance. And if you don't do that in those two chances, then they reject the, the product. So you either have the product come back to Kenya or they're destroyed. So I think after going through this, that's when I discovered that I need to, um, because I learned a lot and I learned it just by myself. And that's why I've decided to launch the consultancy firm, at least to help Kenyan companies and small businesses who want to export, you know, the, you know, their products to the U.S. to make sure that the product is in compliance by the time it gets to the U.S. Otherwise, they will not. And the minute that you don't do what you're supposed to do, they put you on red flag, so you can never, you can never export that product at all, at all. It is against this background that Lucy decided to start a consultancy firm to educate Kenyan exporters on the new regulations in the U.S. I've realized there are so many small businesses that have been given grants to start maybe manufacturing and all that, but they have done it the Kenyan way and now they want to export to the U.S. So they have to go backwards and actually do a whole manufacturing and um, labeling requirement. So it becomes very expensive, you know, for them. So through my agency, I'll be able to help them right from the word go. I have what is called by FDA export verification. So they have given me that, you know, certification that like the companies that have already helped to come into compliance, I have to come and inspect their factory every two years and write a report. So they have to actually meet all the standard. Lucy is already consulting for a good number of Kenyan companies and some have complied. We have uh, Unga Limited. I'm the official agent in the US. That's Unga Limited for their flower. I also have Pies World is the one that manufactures all the beans and the rice. 
and they are also in compliance with all uh, regulations in the US and also uh, maize food that manufactures or sells dried vegetables so all those are also in compliance and we for all of them we had to do backwards because we already had the products in in the u.s by the time the rule came out so the u.s government gave me chances to actually what they call reconditioning the products so i successfully was able to recondition them so they are okay to sell the products Thank you, Alex, for that inspiring story. And with that, we have come to the end of the show today. For all those who tuned in, thank you so much for watching and see you next time. Home Aid Training Center is a Washington-based organization providing high quality and standard education and training to healthcare workers since 2017. Along with other entities owned by a managing director, Professor Steven Jenga, other services we provide include smart custom and print services, notary services, cooperative bank diaspora account opening, student placement program, book publishing, company registration, and the Western Union agent. For details, call us on plus one two zero six five six six four six seven six or plus two five three eight nine three nine seven six eight or visit us at thirteen zero five South three hundred and twelfth Street, Unit two hundred two Federal Way, Washington nine eight zero zero three, located behind H Mart.